Or it might have been on HBO, now that I think about it, because we were watching Game of Thrones. It could have been an HBO commercial. <laughs> Excellent. Um, this is an Inside Jerry's Brain Call on Wednesday, May 1st, the 1st of May, 2019. Uh, we have as our topic, uh, does 2020 indicate some kind of a generational tipping point? And we're just starting to dip into the conversations. Ken was telling me about a short trailer that he had just watched uh, from young people saying, we're coming. We're, we're, we're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore, to borrow an old phrase. Yeah, it was, it was very inspiring and caught both my wife and I by surprise. I'm trying to remember, it could have been, we sort of squad on our next door neighbor's HBO and Showtime. And, and so we, uh, we were watching Billions and Game of Thrones on there. And <laughs> it was on that or, or on a disc that I got from Netflix. Um, but it was very powerful. It was like, wow, that's hopeful. That gave me a jolt of, yes, it's good to see this. Like, I hope this gets out there and spreads. I really hope this is going to be the, the case. That'd be great. I'd love that. Um, and, and so I'll describe the moment. I, Kevin Jones said he appeared to say that he was going to be on the call uh, right now, which I would love, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't see him yet on the call. So I will trust that if he's going to make it, he's going to make it. Uh, so let, let me just describe the moment I had a couple weeks ago in Boulder. Um, and I'll, I'll, since this is inside Jerry's brain, I have a little bit of uh, moderator's permission to overshare my brain. So as I talk, I'll, I'll kind of come here because I, I created this thought in my brain um, as I was having that notion. And I was, I was sitting at the Conference on World Affairs, that which April and I have gone to now for three years in a row. And the Conference on World Affairs is a, uh, my brain is a little slow. Well, that's interesting. Uh, there we go. The Conference on World Affairs is a uh, all volunteer event that happens over five days and you get put on some panels uh, that are kind of your own sweet spot and you get put on some panels that, that are not. So I was on a panel late in the week on the opioid epidemic and I'm like, I'm not an expert there, but had a fun time anyway. But at the very beginning, the first panel I sat down to listen to was about Gen Z. And I'm typically a little leery of generational descriptions and trying to generalize from generational descriptions and boomers are this and Xers are that and so on and so forth. Um, so I don't know that I want to connect the thought I had specifically to Gen Z, but I do want to connect it to young people because uh, it suddenly dawned on me. I was watching, there were two young people on the panel uh, and they were highly capable. They were uh, both, um, uh, they were both from Europe, so they were both having a, a great time. And I realized that there were a whole bunch of different things that had to do with young people who were kind of in different ways fed up and about to take action. Um, maybe the most notable of those most recently is Greta Thunberg, uh, who starting at age 12, yeah, hey Michael, welcome to the call. Um, Greta Thunberg, uh, who at age 12, now she's a bit older, uh, started speaking out and has spoken in front of the United Nations and so forth. And what's really interesting is she wants people to act as if this was World War II level of emergency. And everybody's like, gosh, isn't it cool that a young woman can speak like that? And they, they, don't, they don't pick up and start doing stuff. So she's getting, you know, uh, mobilizing school strikes for climate change, which I've got here in my brain, uh, and a bunch of other things, basically saying, look, look, people, the house is on fire. You older generation have had many chances to work on this, and you're really screwed it up. Um, and so we're going to do something about it. So that's one. And then uh, the Marjorie Stoneham Douglas students, the Parkland students, uh, after the, the shooting. And there have been way too many shootings, uh, way too often. In fact, if I go here, uh, here's the Stoneham Douglas shootings. I have a thought in my brain for school shootings, which is depressingly uh, full of, uh, of shootings that have happened. Here we go. Well, that's interesting. My brain is not... There we go. So here, here are um, school shootings in my brain from Columbine to, uh, you know, all of uh, Virginia Tech to a whole bunch of others. And um, the MSD students have been very different from others and mobilized and spent a year on a bus going around the country talking about this. I don't know exactly what they're up to at this very minute, uh, but I was really motivated by, by their response that with never again boycott an RA, a bunch of other things coming out of uh, the, the Parkland students. Then I realized that my favorite candidate in this uh, 
upcoming electoral cycle. My favorite candidate so far is Pete Buttigieg, um, who is seizing people's imagination. And I, he seized my imagination uh, at the very beginning when he had an interview uh, on The Late Show. And he just sat there and every answer he gave was better than I could have imagined the answer be. And I was like, oh, okay. And and he's now been, you know, under the spotlight for quite a while and we will see how this plays out. And there's still two years until election time. But I realized that one of the things that Pete answered when he was asked, hey, isn't it crazy that you're gonna be 39 if you were elected? You'll be 39, you'll be younger than JFK, everybody else. And his answer is, you know, it's, first it's audacious for anybody to imagine being president nice answer. And then he says, but this is really about generational change, that, that the older generations have fallen down on the job and the current generations in charge are sort of proving this. And we need to um, step in, step up and make this change well, you know, now that we can. So that was great. And then, and then I also had uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and others doing the Green New Deal uh, leading proposals to tax the, tax the rich, Medicare for all, a series of one would, would consider, you know, New Dealy, very um, social democratic kind of proposals that are getting a tremendous amount of traction. And the undemonization of the term socialism uh, for at least some proportion of the population. Uh, I, I should also include that um, universal basic income is one of these very, very interesting. Uh, sort of bipartisan kind of things where you'll see Cato Institute and some conservative people coming out in favor of some form of universal basic income, as well as a whole bunch of other people thinking about it. So these were all uh, the kinds of things that, that um, provoked me to start saying, A, if these things can start pulling together, maybe they can actually uh, cause a, a large shift in terms of who represents us, in terms of what policies get proposed and how things get done. And then B, how do we help that happen? I mean, that, that's my, my own sort of goal, role, desire in this is to help catalyze this generational tipping point because I pretty much agree with the descriptions I just I just gave you that that, you know, the older generations have fallen down on the job and are in vapor lock politically there you know there there's been intentional division divisiveness uh, of the body politic we cannot get shit done and um and we got to break through somehow so that that's my opening premise and uh i'd love anybody to take it in any direction you'd like and todd do you is it sounds like your audio problems are resolved if you want to unmute and jump in Yes, uh, it seems like resolved. Uh, and and I, I don't have, I just found out about this five minutes ago and I've got, I've got a little time. So I wanted to hop on, join, see what's, and uh, happy, to, happy to participate for a little bit. But uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you, that's great. Um, does any of this, does any of this um, either uh, rub you the right way or rub you the wrong way? Oh, so, so right. Um, as the, the father of a, 21 year old who's about to graduate from the new school uh, in two weeks. <laughs> Yay! Uh, wow. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really aware of, of her, 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 the work and the thinking that she's doing and what she's, you know, ready to take on. And, uh, she, you know, the one way I'm supporting is supporting her, trying to partner with her because I, I think she's, um, she's got a lot, you know, a lot of energy ideas and, and currency. Uh, and, um, so, um, yes, yes. And, and just seeing, you know, I'm, I'm here at the impact hub in Oakland. Uh, I work out of, out of this space and there's, you know, just looking around, it's, it's mostly, you know, young, vibrant folks that are out to make an impact in the world. And, uh, again, trying to connect with them and support them and in, in every way. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you, and I, I think that notion of how do we how do we make ourselves good allies without coming in and saying we know better is really big. I think that's that's super important. Um, cool that your daughter's at the new school. The new school has great history. Like it, it was a, a place of massive social change back before World War II. Basically, a lot of refugee thinkers showed up at the new school and formed the basis for tremendous uh, body of work. 
yeah, she's she's soaked it all in. She's studying media, culture, and uh, capitalism studies. And the, the paper she right now is called uh, like Thought Bubbles. No, yeah, Thought, yeah, Thought Bubbles, uh, Segregated Memory, and Fossilized Distrust in American Democracy. Wow. So she's- Wait, Thought yeah. Bubbles, what was it? What was the second one, Segregated Distrust? No, uh, Segregated Memory and Fossilized Distrust in American Democracy. So I've I've only read the the two page proposal and I was like whoa you're you're putting it all it's so very well put and I can't wait to read the paper. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's beautiful. Um, fabulous. Thank you uh, and thanks yeah. for, for jumping in. Nice to nice yeah. to make make your acquaintance and feel yeah. free to jump in at any point. This is all very informal. Yeah. Um, uh, Michael, any any thoughts on on the the st our starting point here? And you are muted. There you go. Um, many thoughts. Um, nothing very coherent. <laughs> um, you always say that, Michael, and then you come out with something brilliant. Uh, no pressure, huh? Yeah, um, no pressure at all. Um, well, I, I, you know, I think it's it's when the going gets crazy, the crazy got to get going. So I think that, that there's a match here. Um, there's certainly something happening. The pieces are not so much falling into place as falling apart. The defossilization, in some respect, but it's going to be a crazy ride. So um, the more we are in, enabled to empower these um, fresh initiatives, the, the anybody below the age of sixty, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, no, I think uh, you. Your take on it, the sort of things that are showing up, yeah, perfect, yeah. Thank you. Also, um, not a young person's thing, but a really nice cross-generational thing that's happening uh, and spreading quickly is this Extinction Rebellion set of protests mm -hmm. um, that are being extremely creative about how to do nonviolent social action. Um, so I'm really liking that. Uh, and it's funny because Donald Trump in particular the way he ran and the way he's acted as president has normalized crazy. So, mm -hmm. so it, it, in the previous president's administration, it was no drama Obama. During eight years of Obama tenure, there were zero scandals, zero, none, right? Which also meant that for eight years, he was basically operating within a straitjacket, that, that he didn't have a lot of elbow room to do much of anything. He, his, his was a an administration of, of compromises and of getting a few things done, but really, really not being able ever to be seen as angry or anything like that. And, and, and now we have a president who's completely normalized waking up in the morning and having a tantrum on anybody who's crossing his mind or Fox and friends on Twitter and making the news that way and on we go. And that's, that's a normal beginning of a day in the current president's administration. And a piece of what I'm thinking about is, Okay, good. Uh, I hate that that's happened. What does crazy look like from the other side? What, what, can we take that elbow room? Can we take that leeway and do something really crazy ass productive with it? Uh, Ken, I think you probably have a, a couple of ideas going here. I, I wanted to throw it to you. You know, I was having a conversation this year with a friend of mine about what's going on in the world. And he's talking about the pendulum swing. Your voice is suddenly much lower than it was before. Better now? A little bit better now. Okay. I think I have my hands on it. So, I was oh, okay. a conversation yesterday with a friend of mine about what's happening in the world. And, and, you know, so we're going we're gonna to talk about you know, something that, that's really cool. So you suggest two things I'll suggest. Can you bring your computer closer to you? Yeah. Um, You're suddenly much lower volume than before. I'm going to go grab my, my earbuds. So I'll be right back. Uh, cool. And hold that thought. <laughs> Um, if either of you'd like to jump in, please feel free. Well, I liked, I liked what you said um, earlier about uh, supporting them without, without being, you know, 
overdoing it, you know, like how with my daughter, you know, I, I, I'm like, I don't want to like, here's how to do it. You know, I want her to come to me, but she sees the work I'm doing and she gets inspired and she asks questions that I'm not like, you know, it's, it's a balance. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll kind of wait for folks to come to me before like, Hey, I've got, I've got the way to go. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, go ahead. I'm, I'm, the other th well, group I want to bring in is Ashoka and thinking about the work that they're doing in mm -hmm. supporting, uh, you know, innovation, innovative leaders, um, and uh, that work. Yeah, agreed. Um, and I had a thought that just like fled my mind a moment ago. Sorry, uh, Ken. Do you want to jump jump back in? And now we don't hear you at all. Try again. Make a noise. No. Now you've frozen. <laughs> the freezing is gone. Uh, you're, I see your lips moving, but we're not hearing you. We're yet. not hearing you. Yeah. Here we are. No, no, we're not. Oh, man. I feel like a cell phone commercial. Can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, yes, only you're still really low volume. But uh, if there's any way you can speak into your mic or whatever, that'll help a lot. Close as I can. Okay. It's you, now you need to select the right microphone. So when you go to the little microphone and the up arrow and then select external. That's probably the problem. Yeah, it's not listening it from the right microphone. Right. In the Zoom setup or in the uh, system setup? In, 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 I'll be in Zoom. Okay. About One or the other. Better now. Because you were louder at the beginning of the call. That was very strange. Is it, has it better now? Yes. yes. For some reason, I went into the Zoom preferences. I'm gonna try and you it said, out. make me sound bad? And, and it, set, <laughs> it was set all the way over to the left. So I moved, I moved it. It's working. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. So I had, this, I had this, this friend that we get together and have very interesting conversations. And he said, you know, What's, what's something on your mind? And, and I said, my big question right now is how to be effective. There's so much change going on, you know, and so many places to put our attention. We have to be very careful. My experience as a facilitator is whatever you focus your attention on, whatever you focus your group's attention on grows in your awareness. So, you know, he started to talk about pendulum swings. And I flash back to my childhood of going to the Boston Museum of Science. They had a wonderful sand pendulum there. And you'd take this pendulum and pull it all the way back and let it go. And if you watched it for a little while, it didn't just swing back and forth. Because of the, it was hanging from a very high point in the ceiling because of the Earth's rotation stuff, it would trace in the sand this very complex, we didn't realize it at the time, but it was a complexity pattern, right? And I think when people use metaphors like pendulum swings, we're thinking back and forth instead of a pendulum swinging around mm. in cycles through a, a, a pattern where sooner or later it's going to coalesce into that particular corner or that particular area. And there's very strong um, signals coming, converging from AOC, from Greta, from, from the sun, from generation waking up, from all these things. And as far as I can tell, they're still flying below the radar because they're not paid attention to by the mainstream media, but they're all over Facebook, they're all over Twitter. They seem to be pretty well known in the Bay Area. I don't know about the rest of the country because I'm in the Bay Area and it's, you know, that bit of a bubble. But I remember almost 30 years ago hearing Michael Reed recite Yates' second coming. And there's a line that says, things fall apart but something will not hold. I went to him afterwards and I said, when the center will not hold, where do you go? Said, you go to the margins. You look for what's happening on the margins because that's what's going to come in and fill the void when the center falls apart. And take you for an example. You know, Detroit, the city that was abandoned by, it was a huge industrial capital machine, right? And it was abandoned when the, the daughters, she went belly up. And people on the margins went in there and they've begun to reclaim land. They're, they're doing urban gardening. There's all kinds of very interesting experiments going on there. 
So I'm sensing that there's lots happening at the margins. And the question is, is there enough of a critical mass for it to bring us to that tipping point? And the, the fear I have is that it, the certainty I have is that it is, the fear I have is it's not going to happen in time because if it doesn't happen in 2020, I'm afraid what will happen in the next four years to the next election will be so catastrophic. We'll never recover. So there's, I'm paying attention to Greta's um, admonition to act as if the house is on fire. And I've been acting as if the house is on fire for 30 years. So finding ways to speak to people about it that doesn't trigger denial, that doesn't trigger fear, that doesn't trigger, oh my God, but that moves them to action brings me to my question of how do we be effective? What, you know, how can we talk to people about these very challenging things mm -hmm. that, um, and take them, they're going to bump up against despair. I just was, was I posted a Joanna Macy interview today because we bump into despair. Um, it's, it's an appropriate response when you see what's happening to the land, to the water, to the air, to the, the, the future generations. It's an appropriate response to, to be first outright outraged and then deeply saddened and into despair. And if you can't move through that at an emotional level, you'll stay stuck at a cognitive level of being in denial or taking one side. So I think the complexity of it is just freaking enormous. The challenges, uh, they, uh, there's the cognition part, there's the emotional part, there's the social part, there's the relational part, there's the ancestral part, the transcendence. You know, how do we put those into um, chunks that people can digest? And one thing for Joanna's interview that I posted today, she said, you know, the work that reconnects is done in groups and there's power in speaking your, your truth and your despair because it breaks the myth of isolation. We are not isolated. We are inherently a collaborative and cooperative species. And when you begin to say, this is, this is what's going on for me. This is, this is my despair. People are touched. They're moved by it. And they're moved to action in a way that they don't get if all you're doing is yelling and being angry. Mm -hmm. So those are, that's, I don't know how coherent that is, but that's my, mm. but for me. It's, it's lovely. Um, and resonates in many different ways with things that I'm seeing. Uh, and then partly um, there's a couple of, of sort of large dark clouds in the background, one of which is that a bunch of people have discovered that they can weaponize truth and trust in, in political discourse and that it, it's winning them elections. And that social media have very poor defense mechanisms against this happening to them. Uh, so th there's that kind of going on, which is really difficult. And then right next to that, is a, a, a sad truth that most people will, uh, they will prefer membership over logic. Meaning if they're faced with the decision of saying something that's gonna get them booted from their in-group uh, or adopting a new line of reasoning, they will, they will ignore the line of reasoning as inconvenient in order to stay within the in-group. Um, and that's just, one of humans sort of lesser, less noble traits is that, is that we're willing to overlook a lot of reason uh, to get someplace. N never mind that sometimes the reason is complicated, never mind a, a whole bunch of other things, but even just this whole thing that membership trumps reason uh, much of the time. And I can, I've got that in my brain, which I'll, I'll show in a second. So, so one of the things I really admire about Buttigieg is his ability to speak in ways that I can imagine people who are conservative also appreciate entirely. I, I also like this about his basically uh, resume uh, that he did a tour in Afghanistan, you know, and was in danger and, uh, you know, is a mayor of a Rust Belt city who's done a few things, not a whole bunch, but a few things that are interesting and, and seem to be helping, you know, the city and so forth. So, so I'm listening with care to that because at some, in some sense, Greta Thunberg is at the opposite rhetorical extreme, right? She's saying, we are in meltdown. You are ignoring it. You need to wake up and act as if the house is on fire. And that is the opposite rhetorical, and again, not opposite, opposite, but, but it's, she's way at the other end of the field somehow from, from Mayor Pete's approach. Uh, to this whole issue. And, and I'm acutely aware, and I think many of our conversations here in Inside Jerry's Brain keep coming back to this notion of how do we surface these things in a way that leads us to action, in a way that doesn't distance the other, 
diss the other, ignore the other, and make things worse. I want to say one more thing. I went to hear Larry Lessig two weeks ago. He was here in Santa Fe, and I'd never heard him speak before. It was, I was very pleased with, with his presence, and, and they opened with um, Will Durst, who's a political comedian, and, and I got to say, I laughed my ass off. The guy's very funny, but uh, one of his better lines was, you know, traditionally the presidency is not an entry-level job, which I found very <laughs> amusing, but um, uh, Larry was saying that he, he showed some very disturbing graphics of how, um, you know, how little power voters have. And you know the amount of time that once elected Congress people spend 30 to 70 percent of their time dialing for dollars, and they, the presidential campaign happens in 14 states. It does not happen in California. It doesn't happen in New York. Those are not important states because the money, the the, the the way the electoral college sits, there's 14 states that determine what's happened. Candidates go to the big states to raise money, but they don't actually go there to to talk about what they're going to do and and connect with the people. And then this really disturbing graphic that said, you know, um, if, if you're a special interest, you know, you can get stuff done. But if you're the people, it's flat. Nothing happens. And what was really interesting was two things he said. One is that 89, his research is on 89% of people are aligned in an agreement that the system is broken, that it's not serving people, and that it needs to change. And yet nothing seems to be happening. That was one interesting thing. The second interesting, interesting thing he said was, I'm actually more optimistic and hopeful now than I have been in years. He too is seeing something that he thinks 2020 is going to be a turning point. Yeah. I don't elaborate on any specifics, it's just it's, it's a gut thing and people I'm talking to and the way I'm being received. So that's another, you know, it, it's anecdotal evidence, but it was, Delightful to hear him say that because I know he gets around quite a bit and, and you know he's he's not always welcome in some of it with his message is not always welcome. So if, if he's getting a better reception, that speaks quite well, I think, to our, our future. Yeah, and I, I love his speaking style and I love the way he thinks. Uh, so one of the sentences you just said or phrases you just said is that nothing seems to be happening. And I will throw a contrarian thought on that, which is that Donald J. Trump is a fire ship that who has been sent into the system to destroy it by some large proportion of his voters. And so far he is succeeding. He has put morons and PR hacks and lobbyists in charge of large departments, given them instructions to dismantle all the, reg all the regs and basically leave the sign on the door, but take apart everything possible. The judiciary, um, uh, one of the things that uh, What's his face, Mc, uh, Mitch McConnell is doing is he's fast tracking approvals of everybody in the judiciary uh, so that he can load up the entire system with conservatives as fast as possible. Uh, so there is stuff happening. It's just reactionary stuff that's happening that's being, I think, remarkably successful. Mm -hmm. um, if you're an evangelical Christian, uh, Donald Trump has been the best thing for you in five conservative administrations. I hate to say, um, I really hate to say, but, but that's not nothing happening. This is um, obviously an important moment for me to introduce this device. This is Tensegrity? Yeah, this is um, three things pulling in different directions and held together with string, and it's the basic building block of the universe. But most interestingly, it's, um, if I get this the right way around, you can see it there, it's a spiral. You see, mm -hmm. it's spiral that way, and you turn it over, it's the spiral the other way. Mm -hmm. So what these things are, is, it's easy to look at them as a, a whirlpool, because that's what it is. It's mathematics or vortex, the, the smoke ring. And the thing about these things is, as you're getting into them, it just gets faster and worse until all of a sudden the same elements are expanding you out in the other direction. Mm -hmm. There's sort of an, an inversion of all the polarities. You know, uh, it's sort of, well, we can't do this because this gets in the way, and then we can't do that because that gets in the way, and then we can't do that because this gets in the way, and, and you're just oscillating around this, this curve. Right. And you push through the other side, and all of a sudden, it's it's totally transcendent, with no reason at all. It reminds and, me of uh, 
sorry, Carol Quigley wrote in Tragedy and Hope about the sort of what, what caused the lock-in of the Great Depression. And I don't remember any of the details, but basically each of the countries was leaning against the other country in a different way. Mm -hmm. And there were all these kind of bilateral lockups that were terrible and nobody was willing to rip this up and change the policies and move things around. So everybody was stuck for a decade. Uh, in the Great Depression until war kind of pulled everybody out. But, but it, looks, it, it felt, feels like it looks like the, the thing you were just holding up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it sort of, it's wicked problem sort of territory. And uh, you can't fix one thing because the other one pops up, whack a mole around the loops. But okay. then it, it sort of moves through some sort of a, an urgency of confusion, very mm -hmm. much through the looking glass, through the inversion. And... Uh, um, it just looks different. So let me um, throw something in that I just discovered over the last couple of days because uh, uh, I just met, I met a woman who's just moved here to Portland. We sat down and had coffee and she was like, I know that we just got into Portland, but I'm about to sign up for this transition design program at CMU for a year. And I'm like, what's transition design? And uh, I hadn't really heard of transition design and I do collect in my brain uh, design specialties and I'll show you, uh, oops, it's not behaving the way I'd like it to, uh, there we go. So this is just A through D of design specialties from active design and activity centered design uh, to bio design, biophilic design, critical design and drug and Dutch design over here. So the, you know, the scroll bar will show you more types of design. But transition design is drawing on um, the great transition idea, which is, uh, has been in, and I think this is part of the, one of the movements, Ken, that you were kind of alluding to when you were saying, hey, people have actually been work, you know, people have been on deck working on this really hard. And so transition towns, the age of transition, commons transition, a whole bunch of other transition is a, is a very powerful uh, meme here for where we're moving and how it's moving. Uh, he's uh, the transition designers are also pulling on uh, wicked problems as Horst Riddle uh, kind of uh, defined wicked problems way back when of situations that are so complicated that you just uh, sorry Horst Riddle that you think you're never going to you know get out of that kind of that kind of problem you, that, that there's no real way out and then also transition design is pulling on a lot of systems thinking and sort of uh, systems change thinking in very nice ways. Uh, so I'm Terry Irwin is the head of the program. Uh, if you go look at the transition design seminar, uh, I was quite amazed and I'm halfway through listening to this talk of hers. I will share links to the talk in our chat and to this spot in my brain in our chat. Um, but I'm quite blown away by the sophisticated way in which uh, transition design seems to be pulling a lot of the right elements together. So I'm going to try to learn more and maybe do a, an IJB call about transition design because uh, I'm finding it uh, to be extremely amenable uh, as a gathering point for thinking about how to go about doing the change we're talking about. Does that make sense? Fabulous. Nice to see you have Council of All Beings in there. Have you ever done a Council of All Beings? I have not. I have not. What's it like? It's um, profound. Um, for those that don't know it, a Council of All Beings is, is held in, an out, in a, a natural space. I did one with John Seed, who's one of the um, co-authors of the Joanna Macy of Thinking Like a Mountain towards a Council yep. of Beings. And you're instructed to go off and spend time alone in nature and find something in nature that you feel is... Um, uh, under threat and find something that represents it and you come back and um, one by one people go around the circle and they say this is my object and it represents the dolphins or the whales or you know the trees the old growth trees and and you speak about what it means to you to um, uh, you, you try to speak with the voice of whatever you're representing and also what it means to you to see it leaving and um, it, it's it's one of those portals that takes you into another dimension of being um, where you're asked to speak on behalf of another entity. So that's pretty interesting. Um, and you're also uh, confronted with the fact that you're, you're with a bunch of people who are now giving voice to other elements of life. And, um, and that has a very interesting 
way of waking different parts of your brain up. Um, and then there's, there's yeah, moving through the, the despair part of that of, you know, what are we going to do about it? Um, mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's a ritual for, for healing and bringing some beauty into, into a destructive act. Um, it's been, geez, it's been like 25 years since I did it. So I'm, I'm a little hazy on all the details, but I just remember the emotional tone to it. Um, yeah, and the other part of the transition, um, there's the work of the great turning from David Corton and Joanna Macy, mm -hmm. um, which brings in one of my favorite things is working with beings in deep time. Uh, so one exercise we did when I used to hang out with Joanna a lot in the early nineties and this was a group about a hundred people and we were outside and we had 50 people in an inner circle and 50 people in an outer circle. And the inner circle were people who were living 10,000 years from now. And they would ask questions of those of us on the outer circle saying, you know, one scenario was their, their, their world is thriving. And they would say, what did you do to provide us with a thriving world? You know, you made your, your generation was critical. You were there alive at that critical turning time. And what did you do? And then we did the flip side, which is their generation is actually just barely scraping by, hardly surviving at all, terrible, low quality of life. And they would say, what did you do? And again, it, it wakes something up in you to participate in this that, that brings a very different perspective than what you get from reading about something or, or you know, just being in your own little bubble. You know, very few people think in terms of 10,000 year life cycles. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a stretch for, for most of us. Well, um, short termism is epidemic and I think very intentionally. Also, fear, the politics of fear drives people into short-term thinking and basically, you know, eliminates your, your short-term storage. You go from being able to remember like seven plus or minus two things to maybe three when you're, when you're afraid. And when you have no time, when your time is filled with constant nonsense, you also don't have time to attend to things like empathy and, you know, concern for, for other sorts of things. So all of this is very nicely reinforcing uh, people's not paying attention to, um, to all of this. Here we go, I found a nice thought. Three dimensions of the great turning. Uh, number one, actions to slow, the to slow the damage to earth and its beings. Two, analysis of structural causes and the three, creation of structural alternatives. And three, a shift in consciousness. And if I had a nickel for all the different people who are trying to create a shift in consciousness for the better, I'd be wealthy. And, Hopefully so would be, you know, so would all the people working on that. But uh, it's, it's amazing how often this thought here is not connected to nearly enough, uh, nearly enough things because uh, clearly this has been happening all over the place. So here's a, here's a piece by Navi Raju uh, about bioeconomics and uh, the Frugal Innovation Hub and a couple other, you know, Conscious Society, Reinventing How We Consume, Work, Relate and Live, a book that he's writing. So, so I'm especially interested in how we can be good allies for the young generation. I'm, I'm, I'm just very curious because I'm happy to share all the things I've found that have been struggling with this and chewing on it over the years. Um, I have had the great pleasure of meeting a bunch of young people who have made more strides in understanding how the world works than I have and then really seem to get it. And, 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 they're not naive. They're, they, 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 they seem well informed about what the problems are, but they seem also to have like a systems perspective and other kinds of, of good things and, and surprisingly broad purview over what's happened and what, what's going on. So, so how do we become great resources and help make the links? I think a couple things come to mind. One is, um, you know, one is to try to be at, uh, at hand, but not, you know, not telling people what to do. Um, another one is that, I think a lot of what we carry is uh, a memory of what's gone before and stories of why it failed, stories of things that actually did work, but stories like that are actually helpful when you're planning looking forward. And every now and then I see people, you know, reinventing stuff that somebody's already doing and you don't need to waste your breath and, and, and life energy doing because all you need to do is back those other people and then pick the next problem, right? Um, I, see, I see a bunch of that happening. But I'm, I'm trying to figure out how does, how does sort of history and context 
uh, help us. And then the third thing that occurs to me is uh, making introductions and being a bridge. So connecting people that need to connect uh, and then seeing if we can be of help for whatever those new, new connections make or want to do. Look for opportunities to collaborate. It's not like, you know, one's leading the other or, you know, we have to offer, but look for, you know, ways to bring young people into the work, any work you are, you know, that you're already involved in. Um, that's, that's one thought. Totally agree. Um, and I have a funny feeling there's many, many ways and times to cooperate. It's just finding our way to them. And then some of us need to make a living as we're cooperating. So that actually, you know, layers a, a bunch of complexity on top of, of this because a lot of the work to be done isn't hard to do, but it does require time, effort, and focus, but it, it often is unpaid. Um, and that's a problem because if we, you know, if we've got to all figure out how to stay in the monetary economy while doing this work, that's got to, got to get figured out somehow. The thing that comes to my mind is, is more of a quality than a, than a, a doing thing, which is having some humility. Um, the older I get, the more I realize, you know, I really don't know <laughs> very much. <laughs> There's so much to know in the world. And, um, and I've seen so many young people, as you were just mentioning, who've got things figured out at age 25 or 30 that I, like, wow, where did you get that? You know, like, that's amazing. And so I find myself quite often humbled and, um, you know, like I, 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 I want to contribute and I, I, I don't want to be that person that's, that knows it all, right? Mm -hmm. um, as the older guy. Um, and it's very odd for me to be the older guy because throughout my entire life, I've always been the young person with a bunch of older people. And, um, and now I find, I'm finding myself being the oldest person in the room and that's really challenging sometimes. Um, so along with humility is humor, you know, um, uh, recognizing that I often don't know what they're talking about because they're using some lingo that I'm not up on, you know, the jargon and whatever that is for the day. Um, I do have a young man that, that I've met through the Institute for Evolutionary Leadership and I'm, I check in with him once a month and we've been working on a project together and I'm, I'm kind of informally mentoring him. And I find that to be really satisfying because, you know, I, unlike Todd, I did not have children and um, most of the time I'm okay with that, but I, I really like that connection with the younger generation. Um, and, uh, and so I need to seek out more of that because I find it's very, very rewarding. And as you say, it's time consuming. I can't be a mentor to a lot of people. That's, mm -hmm. that's um, so also what Todd just said about looking for opportunities to collaborate. Um, I'm pretty clear that, that at this point in my life, as I work with groups, they've got to be multi-generational. You know, we've got to bring in a, a big cross-section of all the generations from young to old, including those who are too young to speak and those who may be too old to speak or whatever. You know? Yeah. I think that's also very important to, to mix it up and, and have the listening for that. Um, you know, sometimes I find myself listening to young people and I really have to ground myself and, and, and go, okay, Turn off the judging mind. You know, I get certain things get triggered, and it's like, oh, and then I'm like, now I'm not listening. I'm in judgment. So coming back to myself and, and really listening deeply for what what's important here, what's underneath this. Thinking about those mentor relationships as being two way. So you know what we have to share with them, and what they have, what we can learn from them and their their perspective, because they are, like you said, they they know more than we do in some things, and they're they're like grown up in this this crazy world um so it can go both ways and like we said about humility mm -hmm. coming with that leading with that and there's a part of um modern literacy the communicational competence that's really interesting in in the sense that some of it is just like you want to throw your hands up in despair like you know instagram feeds and and all, the, all that kind of stuff. And you're like, ah, what is going on here? And then in other cases, the speed with which like something can travel um, and the power that it can have when it hits. Um, and I think a, a lousy example of this, but, but, a, but a moment when it hit me was the Coney 2012, where there was a video made of, you know, get your parents to watch this with you and send money to help get this warlord out of Africa. And it proved to be like, really flimsy and, and poorly done and whatever else. 
But boy, they get a lot of young people to sit down with their parents and say, hey, you must do something about this. Mm. Like it, it, was, it was remarkable in the sense that it could really move and activate a bunch of people. That it being just a video, just an old school video that happened to be on a new social media platform. Um, but I'm torn because, you know, some, some young people are, are, are completely into the, well, I guess since life might end at any moment, I'll just, just satisfy my, my immediate wants and not worry about stuff and not worry, you know, everything serious seems to be too big to, to make a dent in. So we might as well just uh, go on, get on the hedonic treadmill and, and buck up and enjoy it. Um, but then there's a bunch of other young ones who are like, mm, not so much. Let's, uh, let's fix this. Yeah, when, when I first heard about this, I, I was uh, like all into it. Green New Deal, no way, it, you know? And like, I'm like, how can I get involved? And I was like, then I heard, oh, it's just young people. And I felt, oh no, I'm not, I shouldn't go. I was like on my way to a, to a rally. And uh, I stopped myself because I was like, oh shoot, maybe I'm too old to go. And mm. I, I later talked to some of, you know, like, no, you know, and there's, there, there are to be involved, but I'm, I mean, in one way, you know, it's like, no, let them do their thing. And I know that like Naomi Klein's involved with them and that's, that's like really good. They've got support there. Um, so now I just send them money, you know, little money every month. <laughs> Mm -hmm. support that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are there any other uh, young groups that um, that are doing interesting things? Like, it's funny when I, when I think about youth, I think uh, often about like the uh, nerd fighteria. Are you guys familiar with that? No. So uh, Hank and John Green, the Vlog Brothers, um, invented a term nerd fighters or nerd fighteria. And it's, it's not people fighting nerds. So Nick and John Green, you've probably seen some other stuff. Uh, one of them is a songwriter, one of them is an author. They're, they make awesome videos online. They are YouTube stars. Uh, and they invented this thing which is not fighting nerds, it's actually nerds fighting world suck. And so they put really great videos out explaining stuff in the world. And then they give, you know, young people opportunities to get together and go do stuff. And there's uh, the Harry Potter Alliance is kind of like this as well. Um, but I don't know enough about what it's like inside these things and whether they're still, you know, whether the energy is growing or not or what. But these are younger folk. These are like um, usually like tweens, uh, young kids who are, who are learning stuff and doing stuff. But they're fabulous. They have a, a saying, DFTBA, which means don't forget to be awesome. Uh, they created a record label called DFTBA Records, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they have the Project for Awesome, or P4A, which was a hashtag back in the day, um, which was actually nerd fighters on Kiva trying to sort through which Kiva projects uh, nerd fighters should back. So stuff like that. Right, it's 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 just it's really interesting and amazing, um, and I and here's Hank Green and his brother John. Um, so I'm trying to figure out, all right, which of these things is still has heat right now, and is doing really interesting things, uh, and how do we help? Education, basic just research, and trying to provide more information to people about. And John Green is the author of The Fault in Our Stars, and more recent book, An Abundance of Catherines. Uh, Fault in Our Stars got made into a movie. Here it is by Josh Boone with some actors we haven't heard of. So there we are. Yeah, this is great to hear about it. I'm sure there's a zillion more, honestly. I think that they're, they're the young people are out there and uh, you know we're not hearing about a lot of it it's local um, I look forward to spending some time with my daughter kind of checking in on this uh, I look forward to sharing that I was part of this today and uh, kind of tapping into her thinking and seeing uh, you know again looking for ways to collaborate with her and support support her 
you know, in uh, what she's doing. So I think what I'll do is I'll set up a similar call, uh, set it out 10 days or something ahead so we can sort of marshal people and then invite as many young, young capable people as we know to the call and see who can show up and, and see what they say, see where they, where they take this. Um, I, I would love to know. I, Those young people from uh, the call with Sunil that day, his daughters and her friends from India, they yeah. were so interesting. I was really delighted they were on the call. It was like, wow. So They were great. So Isha, I, I, Isha was gone for like three weeks on, on summer vacation. I just saw her on a call this morning. Yeah. Um, she's great. She would be the, like the first person I would ping to invite to, to be on this call. So like that. There's another organization called, I think it's, it used to be Generation Waking Up. I think it's just Gen Up now. Um, I was uh, exposed to them when I was working at the Institute for Noetic Sciences several years ago. And they were all about, you know, getting young people uh, socially active. You know, it's, you've got to go out and register to vote. You've got to work on local issues. Um, and they're, they're pretty widely spread. Um, I think there's many, many thousands in there. So I haven't heard from them in quite some time. I don't know what they're up to, but I do know they exist. Yeah, Joshua Glum is the guy that I, I knew back in the day. Yeah, and, and I, have, I haven't heard anything about them for a while, but this is what I've got. Um, here's Generation Waking Up, Igniting a Movement. We're at a cliff. The story of a generation is to either fall or fly. Is the text <laughs> there. So it, it, it's, it's what Greta Thunberg is saying, except that Greta is getting more traction somehow. I'm glad you brought Brooke right up again. Right, right. There's something I wanted to say. With you. There's young people, and there's old people, and there's youngers, and there's elders. Uh -huh. and just because you have gray hair doesn't mean you're an elder. You know? um, and just because you're young doesn't mean you can't be an elder. To me, Greta is an example of an elder in a mm -hmm. younger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Maladoma Same, who's an uh, initiated West African medicine man from Burkina Faso, said that. Um, in many tribes in Africa now, the older people are, are making younger people official elders and making their chiefs are saying, well, we don't know how to handle this. We need the younger generations wow. to help us. So there is a shift going on in some indigenous communities in Africa where the, the elder younger poles are being reversed, kind of like what Michael was talking about. You suddenly turns into its opposite, you know, and they're, they're, they're saying, help us. We need your help. Um, so that's pretty interesting you know, that's happening in the indigenous world because we don't usually pay a lot of attention to that here with us in the Western world, but I believe it has a very profound impact on us. And um, uh, so when I see somebody like Greta speaking up in the way that she does, which is just, you know, I, she's, I want to take this world seriously. You know, I'm not, I'm not some, I'm just a kid who's taking science seriously. And, um, she speaks with, with clarity and authenticity that is very difficult to argue with in the same way that AOC speaks, you know, she's really disarming and charming and, and, but spot on and, and, and super smart. You know, she's not just some bimbo waitress from, from New York. She's really, really smart, intelligent. Mm -hmm. and, and she's got a way of framing things that is very inclusive without, I know it polarizes those who are just turned off by her anyway, but for mm -hmm. the rest of us, I find her message to be very inclusive. And I think that's another piece that is, is really critical of, um, we need to be discerning about, about things that are toxic, but we need to be in, as inclusive as we can and say even toxic people, if they can get themselves de-traumatized, you know, there's right. redemptive qualities in everybody. Everybody can be healed. Everybody can re be redeemed. Even Donald Trump could be redeemed, which I know would be a heretical thing to say for a lot of folks, you know. Um, but I have to believe that because if I don't, then, then we're all, you know, we're all screwed. Um, I, I just flashed on something. In 2006, I was at a conference on Bali and Desmond Tutu was there and he gave a very powerful talk and he said, you know, when you call someone a monster, this was in reference to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, when you call someone a monster, you absolve them of human responsibility, and then you are able to become a monster yourself. You can say it's a person doing monstrous acts, committing monstrous acts, but you can't call someone a monster. I think that's a really 
key thing for us to pay attention to of who we otherize, who Donald Trump is very easy to otherize. He's mm-hmm. the bad guy, right? And I keep going, well, if, you know, he's a human being and, and he's doing terrible things, where could I find a redemptive quality in there that I could relate to? So, and I, I don't have one. <laughs> I come up empty, but I at least make the effort. But that's the, that's the, that's the action is to try and find where there are shared values and get to that start there, build on, you know, what we, what we do share and agree on and then build from there. It's funny. Um, I think, I think AOC's intentions are very inclusive. I think her approach with the green new deal and with, uh, democratic socialism is kind of the, all right, people, we're fed up trying to play your game and walk the middle course. We're going to actually take a, a pretty strong left course uh, for social welfare and, and all these other things, which then becomes not that inclusive if you've been raised to demonize socialism in any way, which, you know, every two thirds of the three quarters of the country thought, you know, from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, that socialism was as terrible as communism was the, the worst thing that could ever happen to the world. So. You know, we're, we're trying to, we're in the face of that kind of headwind or that kind of training. Um, I remember a long time ago being in a, in a group where Al Gore spoke and his first words were, I don't understand why conservatives don't see climate change as a huge business opportunity like electrification. I do not understand why they, why they don't see that or get that or want to do that. And, and, and so I, I I think that the, the, the politics and the power sort of behind the curtain are, are really powerful here. They're really uh, different from what we think. I, for example, don't understand why, corporate, why American corporations want anything ever to do again with healthcare. If I were them, I'd be saying, go immediately to national healthcare, get rid of, you know, why are companies co-paying health insurance? It's a, it's a handicap in global competition. It's a stupid ass thing. Uh, it's a it's a it's a artifact of World War II. The way we handled um, uh, price freezes during World War II. That's all it is. So why do companies want to continue doing that? I don't get it. Well, I I'm, I need to bow out at this time. I got to jump to another thing, but I really appreciate uh, being engaged and look forward to following up. Getting Thank you, Todd. This is, this is Thanks. great. I really yeah. appreciate you being here. Yeah. Take care. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks. Well, just you and me, Doc. That's right. It's you and me. Uh, if you want, we can kick this around some more, or we can fold the pup tent for now, and uh, I'll set up the, the the next call. Same topic for for the cross generational mixing. I'm just I. I I told you I did a big cleaning project on the grill and I, I skipped lunch and I just realized I'm really, really hungry. I need to go get myself some food before I pass out here. So excellent. Uh, but this has been, uh, it's fun. I really appreciate these calls and good to be connecting with you this way. So I uh, look forward to this, this next call. This was a, this was fun. Awesome. Thank you. Same here. Same right. here. Take care. Bye bye, Ken. Bye.